You're listening to Opera Innovations, a podcast by ABA Technologies. This month on the Thought Leaders podcast, we are back to talk with Tom Freeman to learn more about his history and where he sees the field of behavior analysis going. Introduce me to Jose. And I talked to him for about 10 minutes. So oh, you must see me when you come back down here. You must tell me when you arrive. Well, so, okay. What I was really interested in was at the FAVA conference, they were talking a lot about antecedent interventions. And almost everything that we had been doing in Massachusetts was all consequential interventions. Right. And for me, it was like, it was like an epiphany. It's like, wow, we should really be focusing on antecedents. Um, because we just weren't doing that, you know, and we, I had never heard the term establishing operation when mm-hmm. I was in Massachusetts. We weren't, we were talking about discriminative stimuli, but we were not, there. it seemed like there was, a, it was really advanced down here, which is weird because Skinner was right down the street from us at Fernal. I mean, literally he was at Harvard and right. here I am at, in Waltham, which is, you know, 10 miles outside of Harvard and Skinner's right there. And yet we're, it seemed more advanced down here. So I was sort of excited to come down to Florida. I said, this looks really good. Came down here. I first had trouble finding work and then decided that I would, because it didn't seem like there were a lot of jobs for, quote, behavior analysts. For whatever reason, I couldn't find them. But I started working. I decided, okay, I'm going to work for the state. And I went into this training for, uh, I had experience as a QMRP. So I went into a training for being a case manager. support coordinator as they called them in those days and they may still call them that so there was a seven day training for support coordinators right two i think one week in tallahassee and then a week in the district and i was going to work in the orlando district so i'm in orlando my second week and people are coming in and providing us trainings this is probably in the summer of 1996 and we're going to get our our training our one hour training on behavioral services and uh, in walks Jose. And the minute he sees me, he goes, Oh, where have you been? I've been waiting for you. You should have gotten in touch with me when you got, how long have you been here? What's going on? And I, I couldn't believe this guy remembered me. I talked to him for like five, 10 minutes at the conference. The memory of an elephant. He was waiting for me. Right. So he suggested I come and apply for a job at Threshold, which was the place where he was working at the time, which Ed Blakely had worked at, Mm -hmm. um, before. And it was a place where kind of the, the type of consumer who I had worked with, people with significant behavior problems who were adults. There was a children's uh, facility there, but the, you know, it was adults. And so I figured, okay, I'll go apply for a job here. I went and applied, talked to people. Pat McGreevy was part of my interview team. And so they hired me. And I think the reason they hired me was because they, they asked me a question at one point, And I said, um, I started talking about how the behavior operates on the environment, and I think none of the other people that they had interviewed had talked about like behavior operating on the environment, and so they liked that, and so they hired me. I was not an academic. I didn't have a master's in behavior analysis. I hadn't had met any courses in it. I hadn't mm-hmm. taken any, any graduate courses. I barely read any books or articles. Uh, Murray Sidman had, had been an influence on me and on us because at Kelly Hall, that place that I went to that was supposed to be the worst building and ended up being like the best place I could possibly work. It was an amazing working group of people. And we, that, that was on the third floor of that building that they were working off an article of Murray Sidman talking about a higher order of, um, of compassion, basically like not intervening with somebody, for example, who's banging their head if they're banging their head for attention that, you know, you may need to block it but you're not going to give them attention and try to you know convince them that they shouldn't do this that that's that's playing into the behavior the whole idea of a function of behavior was um part of that approach and so they were very influenced by by murray sidman and um that group basically the the work that we were doing on the third floor with it was all adult women i had three apartments of adult women up there and we were getting really good results and that began that sort of spread through down to the second floor which is where the men's stuff was working in uh it just it we are the effect of what we were doing was spreading right and it was really good it was fascinating to watch and really wonderful to be a part of that working group of people in any case um other than that i hadn't really read much you know i'd read beyond freedom and dignity i had never read science of human behavior at that point 
Um, Beyond Freedom and Dignity is still one of my favorite is it? books that I've read. I should go back and read it now it that I have some perspective. I really should. I mean, since then, I've, you know, read a lot of Skinner and stuff. But the, the point is that, you know, Jose, they hired me, and apparently I just said the right things, but I wasn't really very well educated in behavior analysis. So then I worked uh, at Threshold, liked the job. Um, Jose left at one point to go do something else, and then my son was born in October of 1997, and I really wanted to help raise him, <laughs> and so I was trying to decide what am I going to do here, and so early in 98, um, my wife and I kind of looked at our situation. We were both basically making the same amount of money. Her health care was way better than mine, and so we decided, okay, for the time being, I'm going to stay home with Dave, and she's going to continue to work. So I did stuff at Threshold, gave them sort of my notice, told them that I was leaving, and um, you know I still continued to do some trainings there and stuff, but then basically I stopped working at Threshold and stayed home with Dave when he was from four months old to like 11 months old. And it's probably the best year of my life. I, I just, I mean, I've had many really good years, <laughs> I must say, but being home with Dave as a baby was um, really, really, really cool. It was great. I, I really liked it a lot. Um, although at one point, I must say, I was I was in my bathrobe vacuuming the floor and suddenly stopped and looked at myself and thought, I've turned into Lucille Ball here. <laughs> this is because I thought Dave's first words were going to be Monica Lewinsky because on the TV it was like <laughs> constant about Clinton. And, although his first word was actually Pidgey, which is pickle. So it's, who knows? You know. Anyway, um, so... Um, it was, it was really good, but Kathy got to the point where she couldn't stand not being home. And so, and Jose in the meantime had called me and was trying to get me to go to grad school at FIT because he was opening up the program at FIT. And see, he kind of dragged me into grad school. So I came in essentially three weeks late. I came in as a provisional student because my grades from my first two years of college were so bad that my grade point average was terrible, but my, but my GREs were like through the roof, right? So they decided to take a, take a shot. So I came in as a provisional grad student at the first group to go through the FIT ABA program that Jose had created, right, from scratch, basically. So, uh, that was really good for me. I learned a lot. I read a tremendous amount of material, um, took some great classes. I took a class with Frank Webby about the biological foundations of behavior, which was like the hardest course I ever took in my life, but maybe the best, one of the best courses I ever took. Um, I had boxes of flashcards, SAF meds, I mean, bo literally boxes. Um, but I learned a lot in that great forensics course, um, really some really, really good stuff. So I got out in 2000, and um, the person, while I was going to grad school, I was, always, I was also working full-time at a place in Orlando called SCRI. I was, I was commuting from Orlando <laughs> to FIT to go to school, and then working full-time in Orlando um, at a facility that had three group homes and a workshop, and I was the behavior analyst for oh, that group, right? And my supervisor was a woman named Maria Ruiz, who mm -hmm. was one of the smartest people I've ever known, one of the greatest human beings I've ever known has mentored a tremendous number of people in the field. Maria just died like a year and a half ago, which was a huge loss for the field. And everybody who knew her was like just devastated by her loss. But in the meantime, she was my, I got to have her as my supervisor for like two years. I also had Vince Carbone as my supervisor, by the way. When I first moved to Florida, he's the one that, that I took my certification coursework for when it was the old Florida certification. So Vince was, did the course for my certification. And then he was my supervisor when I worked for Intervention Services under Sharon Older, who was also a great supervisor. I have been so blessed by the people that I've been lucky enough to be supervised by. It's like, it's an amazing array from Mike Lowry to Greg Daramentian to having Charlie Hammond involved uh, to, you know, um, I mean, really, uh, Jose and Pat McGreevy and Sharon Older and Vince Carbone and, I mean, this are, these are really amazing people that I've been able to work under. So that's really basically the only reason I know what I know. And are you still one of, I think, like the 50 people that still have the old Florida certification? 
I they well you know we transferred we transferred our certification over so I'm a Florida I I have my Florida CBA certificate somewhere in right there I think but I don't oh, maintain that cert certificate because <coughs> we transferred over to the BCBA okay. it was the, the that was transferred right I just saw a yeah a thing at Fava uh, James Carr put up a Oh, there table. were a few people who There's were still. There's about like 50. And so they never, <coughs> they never still, switched. <laughs> that still have yeah, the no, CBA. I'm not, no, I'm not, I'm not one of those. No, I got the BCBA as soon as I could. Um, so anyway, um, let's see, where was I? I was still, I was in Orlando. I worked at Threshold. I stayed home with my son. I got pulled into grad school. I got out of grad school. And Maria, who I had worked with, um, Again, she was wonderful. Anyway, she recommended me to a district for a district behavior analyst job, which typically is PhD level, but sometimes they will like, you know, make an exception and have a master's level person come in. And they were, they really wanted, they needed somebody. They'd never really had a district behavior analyst mm -hmm. in District 12, which was Volusia, Flagler County. I mean, they'd had people filling in the role, but they'd never had like a, a designated person. Right. And so I went and applied for that job and I got that job, I got the job. So I was working for Jose for ABA Technologies, helping teach the certification courses, um, which we were doing, it was uh, 12 Saturdays in a row for eight hours a day okay. to do what was then the certification course sequence, right? Um, it's obviously changed since then, but that's what we used to have to do. And then uh, I was working full time then at more, part-time but it seemed like full-time at the district as the district behavior analyst and also they really hired me to be the LRC chair local review committee chair because um, they, they needed a chairperson for the local yeah. review committee who was not who had didn't have a conflict of interest up until then their LRC chair had been somebody from the district and that's problematic because right. when you're providing services in your own district it's kind of hard to be an LRC chair mm -hmm. so they kind of imported me from you know District 7, which is where I lived in Brevard County, and I used to go to the District 7 LRCs, um, but I wanted to run the LRC in District District 12 a little different because they were, they had never really, it was more like a class, you know, like we would, people would come and present programs and we'd talk about things like, well, what is timeout? Because people didn't have a really good sense of like what timeout was. Right. <laughs> and so it, it, for the first couple of years, it was like, it was like a class. Anyway, I love that group of people. It was a great working group of people in that district office. Ed DeBartolabin was the, the head of the office, and then Leslie Richards was there. And, um, there was a whole group of just really good people. Um, Linda Cleary was the nurse, and originally Lee, Lee Barks had been the nurse. And, she, and so I got to see all kinds of things in Florida. And as a district behavior analyst, I had sun, suddenly sort of morphed into an administrator. I had been a, a clinician on call for essentially like 18 years and then you know for in some of that time I was like a program manager at Fernald or I was you know the head of a building for a few stints there or whatever but you know I'd basically been clinical residential clinical person for a long time and then all of a sudden here I am in an administrative position and it was uh, I really liked it it was a great job and um, I probably could have stayed there for a long time, but after I'd been there about 10 years, it was 2010, and Jose was in the process of expanding what he was doing at FIT. I had been one of his original instructors. I did instruct for him in 2008 in, when he was doing live classes. He would broadcast live from Florida Tech, and then there'd be facilitators in four different settings. There was one, I think, in Tennessee, maybe, and there were a couple in Florida. Anyway, I went over to Fort Myers. I was one of the facilitators. So he would talk for like 40 minutes, and then we'd do question and answers live with the crowd, and it would be all day Saturday, right? Well, because some people missed the class, we started making, we would tape the online, the stuff that Jose was broadcasting, and we would present that online. And what we found is people stopped coming to class and started accessing the online version of it. And so the market basically drove us into providing the class online. And Jose linked up with Cindy Schmidt and they, we basically created the online program 
based on what the market was telling us to do. In the meantime, I'm still working at the district, and Jose is building this company, and I was a, a co-instructor for the first group of people through the first third edition coursework. But at the second to last course, my wife got cancer. So I finished off the course sequence, but I stopped teaching mm -hmm. and doing. I still remain district behavior analyst, but I stopped teaching for about a year because I had to stay home with my wife and my kids and deal with that. She's better now, but it was a long year. So after we got through all of that, I came back and started teaching for Jose again um, online. And by this time, a lot of the people who are here now had come and started working for the company. You know, Kristen was here and Corey had come on board mm -hmm. and I, Corey had been in one of my classes in Orlando long before. Jen Montgomery, who I knew from the district because she'd been in the family services program. Um, so there were a lot of people who were working for Jose who were very experienced behavior analysts that some of whom I knew. And so I started teaching for him again and then he started telling me, you have to come work for me. You have to come work for me. You have to come work at FIT. And it just happened to coincide when at in my job at the district, I was beginning to feel like I had been there a little too long. Yep. I had lost my edge. I was not seeing things that needed to be done. I was complacent with what was already happening, um, possibly starting to let people get away with stuff that I shouldn't have been letting them get away with. And I thought, I'm not, I'm not doing this job the way it needs to be done. And nobody was telling me that. Everybody thought that I was doing fine and I was getting all this you know, positive feedback, but I could see that it needed new blood. It needed somebody to come in and basically shake things up a little bit. So I decided this is probably a good time for me to go. And um, I recommended somebody to replace me who is now working for us <laughs> here, Bill. But um, he got the really? job. Really? Yeah, and I recommended Bill. That's for, awesome. Yeah. And he followed me in. <clears throat> And he then followed you, went there, and then he followed me came to, to the, ABA and Tech. Then he eventually came to ABA Tech, right? But I knew Bill, and he, I knew he was around, and I knew he was really good, and had been trained by Eb and stuff, and so he knew, um, he knew a lot. He was really like raring to go. He was very had a lot of energy, and so I thought he'd be a good person. Mm -hmm. And they interviewed him, and they liked him, and so he he got the job. And then I came here, and I regretted leaving for about a year. I really missed my work there because I really liked it. But I like being here and I like teaching too. So ever since then, I've been working for Jose and just creating content. Mm -hmm. And then at one point, Jose was asked to write the chapter for Cooper, Heron, and Heward. And he knew I had writing skills, so he asked me to participate in writing the chapter, which is like, I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. It's not that I'm a great ethicist or know all kinds of stuff, but Jose had had many conversations with me and sort of liked my approach and thought that I had writing skills. So said, will you help me do this? And so I did. So that's how I got involved in that. It's not because I had any great background in it or, you know, you know, you look at, like John Bailey has been working in the ethics field for years and years and has put in tremendous amount of effort to do what he does. And so, you know, I didn't have that kind of background. But I also think you sell yourself short. I, and I have good writing skills. I'm a good writer. I used to want to be a writer. I'm like Skinner in that way. I wanted to be a writer. Like when I got out of college, I would write poetry and yeah. I wrote short stories. I actually went, here, this is a good one you'll like. Yes. I found out that um, Saul Bellow, who won the Nobel Prize in literature, mm -hmm. I found out he was teaching at Brandeis when I was living in Boston. This is in like 19, this must be 1981, right? So I found out Saul Bellow was teaching a graduate course at Brandeis. So me and a friend of mine went to his office at Brandeis and said, can we sit in on your course? He was teaching a course in Joseph Conrad. He said, well, you're not students here. He said, we know, but we really want to hear what you have to say. So he said, okay, you can sit in as long as you don't say anything. Oh, God. So we sat in on this graduate seminar. There were only like like eight other students in the class. Did you actually stay quiet? Yes. We didn't say anything. Wow. We read all the books. We read all the Joseph Conrad books, and we sat there, and we listened to the conversation. And then rather than write a final paper, I wrote him a short story at the end, and he gave me feedback on my short story. So, Because I really wanted to be a writer, right? But I really sucked. I'm still, I'm still, <laughs> kind of, I'm still a little surprised you actually were able to not Oh, for, that was the rule, man. That was, I, I'm not going to like, it, it's like I wasn't paying. I'm not going to, I'm yeah. not going to blow that kind of an opportunity. <laughs> oh my God, I'm sitting in a, in a graduate <laughs> seminar with 10 people with a, with a Nobel Prize winner. I'm not going to blow that opportunity. That's very true. 
So no, I, we just listened. And uh, what I found really interesting is how the graduate students, many of them were, you know, they're trying to make their bones, right? So they're like, like he's saying all this profound stuff and they're sort of arguing with him because they're rather than like listening to what he has to say. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand that's the way it works. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to work in graduate school. But um, I couldn't, I, you know, I don't think that would happen now. I don't think there's any way that we could basically swing that kind of thing now. I've had those kind of weird experiences throughout my life. I sat and got drunk one time with Sam Peckinpah. <laughs> and he taught me how to play dollar poker, you know, the oh game dollar poker. Oh, yes. It was, yeah, it was in college. He was, and he, he was, uh, he was a character, man. He, he came into the school, like, drunk, and then we went out afterwards, after his talk, and sat at his hotel and just, like, um, drank with him and played dollar poker. I think it's a little, I think it's different, too, when you approach people in person. Oh, it is. Much Which is one different. of the reasons they're great to go to conferences, right? Because, right. like, these people who you see as these icons. Right who've seen their name in print mm -hmm. and they like, like, this is just another human being right. that I could just talk to. Yeah. Right. So yeah. Yeah. My brush with greatness, basically. I think so. you've had more than a few brushes with greatness. I still think you saw yourself short. Uh, I, I, uh, I don't, I don't really think so, but, uh, <laughs> Humble. I've been well. I've been lucky, you well, know. One word to describe Tom. And uh, I've been lucky. I basically, I mean, it's like not buying a car. I wasn't in a in a committed relationship for a long time, right. and that you know I didn't have kids till I was mm -hmm. in my forties. Right. Right. So, because my parents were so dysfunctional, yeah. that I didn't want to get into a relationship like that. Yeah. So I was willing to wait. I figured. You're more alone when you're in a bad relationship yep. than you are when you're alone outside of a relationship. Mm -hmm. So I was very hesitant to get involved because yep. I grew up in a situation that was like, when people are always yelling at each other, it's like, yeah. I, I don't want that. You right. Know? So um, it took me a long time to basically find the right person. Well, and the right place and ABA Tech. Did you ever think that back in 1997, ish that ABA Tech would be what it is today? I one of the reasons that I really have worked with Jose for as long as I have because he's a crazy man <laughs> and everybody knows he's a crazy man. I was, everybody waiting, knows I was waiting for it. <laughs> he's a crazy man. But I get to hear Tom on the phone with Jose often <laughs> because I shared office with him. <laughs> So those are some of the most entertaining. And, you know, he listens to me. Those That's are some the of thing. the he, most he, entertaining yeah. phone calls I've ever yeah. heard. I can talk to Jose like a family member because I can I can give him feedback because he knows me for so long. I mean, we've been working together for over twenty years, and so the thing is, his his dedication to the field, Jose. People see Jose's behavior and they think of him as being kind of this goofy guy, and he's probably one of the smartest people I've ever met and his his knowledge of behavior analysis is encyclopedic he can remember in particular books where stuff is um, his knowledge it's like his knowledge of music or his not you know he has certain certain things he's really interested in mm -hmm. and his not he'll remember for example what somebody ordered at a meal that he ate with 15 years ago his so his thing about restaurants and food behavior analysis he knows inside and out yes. right so and then his his dedication to the instructional materials that he's created is really astonishing every time i would teach with jose he would always change stuff up so i'd have all the materials ready to go to teach the the certification class for florida right florida certification this is after i got out of grad school and then he'd give me the next instructional manual. It would all be changed up. Everything would be in a different order. And I go, I said, hey, I've got all this stuff prepared from before. I've got all my notes. They go, no, oh, no, but I was working on it overnight. And and I, and I changed this and I changed this because so he's refined and refined and refined. It's like somebody who who's working on on a piece of art that they just keep working on it, making it better and better and better. Which is one of the reasons that our instructional materials are so successful mm -hmm. for the for the um, especially for the you know, the concepts and principles course, the methods course, um, the acquisition, he used to do all the acquisition, all the deceleration stuff and the ethics, but the, the, those courses, he 
in particular the concepts and principles course and the methods course he has put so much time and effort into that and refined it which is why our students seem to like it and benefit mm -hmm. from that type of instruction Right. And one of the things I really like about working here is that everybody's dedicated to not sort of sitting on our laurels, but making it even better and continuing to improve how we teach this stuff. So, you know, they say in behavior analysis, well, I won't, the student is always right, basically. If the student's not getting it, there's a problem with the mm -hmm. instruction. And I think that that approach is very useful. And you hear people all the time blame their students. Or it's like blaming the parents for not taking good data. Mm -hmm. You know, No, as a behavior analyst, that's your job. Right. You're supposed to have the skills to change their behavior yep. so that they get you the information that you need to be able to talk to them and work with them and make good decisions. That's, that's your job, right? So um, that's one of the reasons I really like working here is that that's the general general approach of the entire group is that like we have to make this better so that our students do better because mm -hmm. it's our responsibility um, and Jose has always modeled that he's always taken that approach and people you know they say stuff sometimes they'll say things that are different but really the it's the behavior that you look at and that's really what we try to do every day yeah, and I mean <clears throat> Jose remembers everything it's amazing it, it's absolutely amazing the, the amount of just things that are in his brain. Right. But I mean, even for my interview for ABA Tech, I, I mean, I didn't know what to expect. I was in Michigan yeah. at the time. But my first, I en actually ended up having to have two interviews because it was basically me and Jose talking for the entire first one. And I did not realize what I was getting. I didn't realize I was like, it's like, okay, well, I should have probably prepped for this interview because the types of questions Jose was asking me I'm very happy that I was able to answer them, you know, on the spot. Right. Because I didn't know they were coming. Right. But, I mean, that speaks to my training and my mentors exactly. as well. But Exactly. But just the it just speaks to Jose and this type of company that he's tried to build. Because, and I know that this is kind of my next question for you. Because I was brought on on, so you work primarily on the curriculum team. Right. At ABA Tech. Right. I mean, you dabble in everything. Right. But primarily the curriculum team working on right now, the fifth edition. Mm -hmm. But Jose brought me on with Allison and Kelly to make sure that this professional development side right. starts to boom. Right. And so that kind of brings me to the next question, whereas where do you see our field going? And or... Where do you want to see it go? Well, I'm in the Pat Fryman school on that, which is that um, behavior analysis has been um, marginalized and pigeonholed for as long as I've been involved with it. And when, by the time when I came into it, it was all developmental disabilities. That was where behavior analysis went. Um, and that was because those are the people who are not receiving services from everybody because a lot of people thought, that was kind of, oh, who wants to work with those people, you know? I mean, literally, I've had people, like, say that mm -hmm. type, type of thing to me. And I'll say, you know, you don't know what you're missing, man. But it doesn't, the, the point is, I mean, some of the greatest people I've ever known in my life have been people that have been developmentally disabled. Mm -hmm. Some of the, really the most amazing human beings that I've ever known. But, um, yeah, we got pigeonholed into that. And then once the verbal behavior stuff started to expand and it became clear that um, Skinner's analysis of verbal behavior was incredibly effective and in particular could be applied to work with children with autism who were diagnosed with autism. Um, then it began to explode into that area. But, you know, Pat Fryman talks about how we have to stop working at the far end of the normal distribution and how we have to get behavior analysis into the mainstream, you know, you look at Bill Heward's stuff that he presents about education and the, the videos that he shows of people doing uh, direct instruction type activities in class where the kids are all like really into it and they're having a great time. It's not some kind of cold academic approach. It's this thing where people are really into it and you've got kids that are supposedly in learning disabled classes that are like pa surpassing their other students. I remember when I first went to see um, a presentation from Morningside Academy, 
that where they showed their data on the kids that were quote learning disabled who had mm -hmm. come into their facility and they rocketed past their other peers in school and they had this thing called head sprout that they developed with Janet Twyman and you know Kent Johnson and TV Lang right so I got head sprout for Dave my son by the time Dave he I, I I uh, had him look at it when he was four. I didn't force him to do it. I just opened up the computer. I said, you know, here's this. You can do this and, you know, whatever. By the time Dave was in sixth grade, he was reading at 12th grade level, right? I mean, his language just exploded. I thought Dave was going to be into language. He's now a mathematician, right? He's a, he's math. He wanted to do math and physics when he went to college. But, you know, he started to learn to play. I, I put instruments around the house and didn't force him to play. And he, like, picked up a bass and started playing bass. Then all of a sudden, he's, he wants to be a mathematician. But his language, you know, he hit head sprout, and he just, his language just took off. In fact, when he was in kindergarten, the teacher once told us, I have to be really careful what I say around Dave because I'll say these jokes that, to amuse myself, you know, I'll say stuff, and none of the kids understand what I'm saying, except Dave. He'll have this look of recognition in his eyes that he understood what I just <laughs> said, and so I have to be really careful what I say. So, yes, mainstream, mainstream education. Why every teacher in the country is not required to take courses in behavior analysis considering it's the science of learning, right. I don't understand why this is not happening. Well, I mean, most of them haven't even heard of Project Follow Through. And, and haven't heard of Project Follow Through, right. and when they hear about behavior analysis, it's like, uh, what so here was talking about yesterday it's like Skinner box um, you know carrot and stick and electric shock and punishment right? robots you know most important article I probably ever read other than like the uh, the Fryman stuff on mm -hmm. this is the Richard Fox article on translating the covenant yes. if those of you who are listening to this cast have never read translating the covenant by uh, Fox you need to go read this article because it's about the language behavior analysts use that block us from being effective in the world and the, the terms that we use that people don't understand, like extinction, you say extinction, people think about dead dinosaurs. So it's a really important article to read. And I think one of the problems with behavior analysis is that there's a precision of language piece of it where the experts in the field and the people who are really high level behavior analysts want to maintain this precision of language, but it also at times prevents us from being able to spread what we know about this into the world in general, which is why like the PBS people, the positive behavioral support people have been successful because they recognize that you need to be able to communicate to the people who you're trying to talk to, right? So, and I don't agree with PBS on everything, but I think that they've taken a lot of behavior analysis and they've applied it in a way that is acceptable. So it worries me that this, that we keep shooting ourselves in the foot to some degree. We're, we're preventing ourselves from moving forward. In the area of anxiety and depression, man, we should be, we should be really working hard. I mean, there's tons of people in the mm -hmm. world who suffer from anxiety and depression. And when we tell people, oh, that's an explanatory fiction, right, that you do this because you're depressed or you do this because you're anxiety, and you say, oh, that's an explanatory fiction. People hear that as saying, that's a fiction. You're, it's, you're a hypochondriac. Right. You don't really have depression. You don't really have anxiety. No, what we're saying is that the behavior that you're engaging is not because of these things. The behavior that you're engaging in is these things. Right. Right? We're, we're not using the label for the cause. We want to look at what, what are the causes here. Um, and I think we also need to work much more closely with um, medical practitioners with we should be working with pediatricians much more we should be with because of prob problems that are brought into pediatric environments this is one of the things pat fryman talks about mm -hmm. is the you know the bedwetting the kid not going to sleep at night these are these are things that behavior analysts could come and help people mm -hmm. with and get infused into the mainstream of society where people look to us to solve these more common problems and then in the educational system mm -hmm. we're not so much solving problems as we're informing what's the best way to educate people right. in just regular education. Right. And I know that when I was doing some independent consulting, some of my families would be like, oh, like super nanny. Right. And right. it's kind of that same thing right. because do I agree with everything that super nanny does? No. no. But 
she uses a lot. She uses a lot of behavioral of techniques. Behavioral techniques. She does. <clears throat> and so that was a that is a way for that that was a way for them to yes. make that connection. Yes, the and dog whisperer. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I know that something yeah. else too. You know, outside of education and anxiety, depression, and you know, like the sleeping, what like toilet toileting, all of that stuff. I know there's. I saw you saw something on um, one of our colleagues' calendars about the sustainability conference yes. planning. Yes. So even expanding out even yes. further. And in fact, I remember Charlie Hammond, who was the head of the psych department at Fernald, when he had been a graduate student for Beth Sulzer Azeroth, mm -hmm. she had been his advisor. I didn't know who she was when I was there. If it's, I, I had no idea. I mean, I didn't know anything yeah. when I was working there about the literature or anything. But she had been his advisor, right? He created a, um, a garbage can that when, when you would deposit stuff in the garbage can, it was when the whole litter, you know, mm -hmm. anti-litter thing was going on, right? Every litter bit hurts, that whole thing. And that, that campaign actually worked. Every litter bit yeah, hurts? Yeah, that's what they said in New York. That was the, that was the <laughs> campaign. And they had, the, like, the commercial with the Native American with the tear coming down when he was looking at all the pollution in New York. And they had a whole thing. And litter in New York really went down. People stopped littering. Well, he created this garbage can that when you would put stuff into it, you would deposit stuff, it would say thank you. And somebody asked him, you know, what do you call that thing? And he said, Arthur. So he named his garbage can Arthur. And the reason he named it Arthur was because that was exactly what had happened in the, in the movie A Hard Day's Night when somebody asked George Harrison, what do you call that haircut? And he said, Arthur. <laughs> so Charlie named his garbage can after George Harrison's haircut. I mean, they still have those. Right. But it was All a, over the place. It was a, that's a sustainability thing. Mm -hmm. It's like looking at what drives people to do things i mean some people will pick up stuff just to hear it say thank you right right yeah. and put it in the garbage can so there are ways that we can use behavior analysis and i tell you dave my son dave he went in and he went in his math and physics right mm -hmm. he got bored with physics didn't think it was that interesting he really liked like abstract math which freaks me out yeah. because that's like so far above what i can do but so he's two years into school, two and a half years into school, he's doing abstract math, and then he starts reading some reports and he goes, he decides, you know, global climate change is such a pressing problem. I have to get more into the applied side of things. So I have to figure out a way to take this abstract math stuff and, and apply it to like global climate change models so that I can have an impact on climate change. This is one of the things that people, I think still to this, to this day, for some reason, are not many people are not recognizing like this is an immediate mm -hmm. crisis mm -hmm. we could i mean the cities on the coast of the united states could be underwater in 50 years us new york could be underwater florida could be underwater yeah. boston could be underwater or at least what you know d close enough not right. exactly underwater right. it's not going to look like a movie right. but people are not responding right. to the things that need to be done now to make these changes they're acting like nothing bad yeah. like everything's fine well and i think it's funny too that you know we come from a field of data like we are data analysts we are obsessed with data right, right. and we could very easily be working with these mathematicians right. and these other individuals to then help change human behavior right very easily i mean my own personal example is so when I before I moved, my apartment complex did not have anywhere to recycle, so I didn't recycle because the response effort right. to recycle was so high. So high yeah. That yeah. I moved down yeah. here, everybody has a recycling can that goes out once a week. I started recycling right away. Exactly. And when yeah. I moved in with my current roommate, he did not recycle. He didn't have recycle. He had nothing to do with it. And actually, just last so like since I moved in, our recycling has actually increased to be, we have more recycling now than we have trash. And like just last night, he comes out and he's about, and he has a can in his hand and he goes to put it in the trash can. He lifts, he like pushes the button with his foot and it lifts up, he looks at it, then he puts it into the recycling bin instead. And I was like, hey! Nice job. He's like, yeah, you saw that, huh? <laughs> and I was like, look at you. Right. But I mean, it's almost as right. simple as that. It can, not right. always, but, you know what I mean? I, I just, I had, I don't even say anything to him about it. I, I just literally put a recycling bin there. Right. 
I think it's a discriminative issue. I think it's an issue of discriminative stimuli. When people start to see their environment mm -hmm. um, in a particular way, they start seeing things. And yes, the recycling may not have a massive impact on global climate change. It will have an impact. It may not have a massive impact. Right. But when people start to be looking at those things and seeing the discriminative stimuli in their environment for these things, for these opportunities to engage in certain actions, and those actions are reinforced, they're gonna, there'll be a generalization mm -hmm. to the other things they need to do. Buying a hybrid par car, buying an electric car, right. then you're looking at you know, voting for people who are conscious of this problem and taking steps to try to resolve these issues, doing the types of things that need to be done in order for us to essentially have global mobilization. Mm -hmm. To, if we want to save our current civilization, you know, that'd be human beings here, right? Right. But the type of civilization, all these advances that people see us making in medical technology and artificial intelligence and all the stuff that people see coming that they're excited about or fearful about or whatever. Um, that stuff could all go away if we have if we have a billion refugees from the coasts moving inward right. and putting pressure on the entire society worldwide. They're, they're, you know, we have to take steps now. So, yeah, behavior. I think behavior analysts could hopefully be part of this solution here because I mm -hmm. think everybody's got to be part of the solution. Yeah, I wish I could say it stops as sustainability. But it doesn't. <laughs> no, we could go on. We could we could go yeah. on about all these different topics there, yeah. about how dissemin how we can disseminate behavior analysis. But well, that's I, why we're here. Yeah, it is. It is, and that's why I was excited to take this job. But I think another thing on top of that is not only recognizing where behavior analysts can be, but also making sure we, as behavior analysts, are educating ourselves on these areas in doing our part in moving forward. Like you said, yes. our, we're pigeonholed, our, we've pigeonholed ourselves into this developmental disability clinical setting. Autism. We need more, yeah. we need more of these people who are pushing these boundaries. I agree, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. People going into new areas. I mean, that's really what yeah. OBM is about, yep. right? It's getting behavior analysis into the world of business and industry. Yep. Um, I mean, I know at FABA, being at FABA this year, Yeah. and this is most of the conferences that I go to. This is just because FABA was last weekend. That the talks that were the most heavily populated mm -hmm. were the clinical autism behavior analysis talks. Right. It's like I love right. to, I love to see people learning what's going on in their field where they're working right now. But at the same time, we need to be. It's called professional development for a reason. Good point. You should you, when you go to conferences, it's good to go to talks that are outside of your comfort zone. Exactly. You should definitely do that. Yes, we need to in CES. We need to be spending not our hundred percent of our right. CE time on where we're study where we're working right now. We need to spend at least fifty percent of that time expanding our knowledge, because I mean, there's people doing some great translational research, and it might look like it's EAB stuff, but that stuff can be, and is being translated into the clinical work. Which would be, yes, exactly. I totally agree with that. Right. EAB people are super important. I don't know nearly as much about EAB as I need yeah. to, and I need to learn a lot more about it. Right. But, you know, when I talk about, like, my life, right, mm -hmm. I had no idea that I'm a skilled whale tracker. Right. I had this skill that I didn't even know I had, and until I got out, if I had just stayed working at the institution, yeah, I'd have I'd have a good retirement plan now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I could probably retire at this point. But Speaking of our four hundred one k meeting yeah, this exactly, morning, <laughs> exactly. But I never would have found out. Never would have gone and worked at Hawaii and like just jumped out of my comfort zone and did something completely different mm -hmm. and found out I'm actually really good at this, and this is something that I get a great deal of reinforcement from doing mm -hmm. outside of my normal stuff right right and it's kind of the same with behavior analysis when i would go with new caseloads you know working with people who were in wheelchairs i worked with one woman that was in a wheelchair who i believe she was normal intelligence and mm -hmm. she she had a she could communicate with this board that was on her her um a 
attached to a wheelchair yeah. where she would move her eyes and she could like spell out sentences and okay. stuff, right? Right, here's this woman who's living with people who are all developmentally disabled, right? right? But I could see in her eyes, I had met her long before when, at a camp experience when I was working with the guys, when I first was a direct care staff person, mm -hmm. and I met Carolyn, and, and it's like, you could just t see in her eyes, this, this woman knows what's going on. She's very aware. So I eventually got to work with her on a caseload, and she would spell out these sentences. And she had one that she, that she would click on every once in a while that just said, it would be the, you know, the voice would be activated and yeah. it would just say, Fernald is hell. <laughs> oh my God, Carolyn, ah, it's awful. But she was, you know, there, so I got to work with all these different people of all these different skill levels and stuff. I, it's not just, and then when I worked with Sharon, I got to work with people in their family homes. I got to work with kids who were having problems in school. Right. I got to work, and so behavior analysts, I met somebody when I was out at the board who was a, uh, closed brain injury person who was mm -hmm. doing really good work with people with closed brain injuries. You have a um, lot in gerontology. Yeah, right gerontology. Now too. That so behavior analysts need to. I know that. See, the thing is, people will follow the money. Right. You follow reinforcement mm -hmm. flows downhill, man. You you, yeah. you know behavior basically flows where the the channels of reinforcement are. What did who was it? It was Aubrey Daniels. Behavior goes where reinforcement flows. And I had, and it's funny because that's the first time I ever heard that. And I always thought of reinforcement and behavior as being like on a hillside, and that reinforcement will follow whatever the path of least resistance yeah. is. That it'll, and that's, and he's, it's like I had the same view. So when yeah. Aubrey Daniels said that, I said, "Yeah, that, exactly, Light bulb. <laughs> exactly. That's that's this is how it works. You go right. where the reinforcement is. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening with autism right now because right. the insurance companies are paying for services for people with autism. Well, and I think too, like, like you said, you're not, you didn't come up through academia, but a lot of our field is following the same path that you followed. They didn't come up. A lot of them aren't coming up through academia. They might've worked in the field, Working heard the about, care behavior yeah. analysis and then decided to go do something about it right. so they might not even really know or understand the the extent that behavior analysis that's can true. stretch that's true because you know unfortunately not all verified core sequences are created equal right and so that's where these this professional development and continuing right. education comes into play and so i think that I think that's very true. And a lot of people who are, like I came from a direct care background. I've always considered myself basically just a direct care person who was made, who's advanced. I'm, you know, that's my background. Right. I'm a direct care staff person, essentially. And there are a lot of people that I've met in the field who come from that background. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to see a, a any kind of like, Sometimes when you go to ABBA, there's almost like, it seems like there's sometimes like an animosity between the, the academics and the real research people and then the practitioners. I've even heard people say things at these conferences that are like, and, and man, we gotta, we, we, are, we inform each other's work. Right. We, we need to, it's like working with a doctor, you know, you, and you work together, you inform each other's work to be more effective for the benefit of the people that you're working with. And, and I've always thought that you should it's good to expand your s skill base to work with to work in new areas it work to do like new things mm -hmm. rather than get settled into just doing one thing over and over and over again you know, right. and constantly doing discrete trial training and it, you know and it also helps prevent burnout it does help prevent burnout it does it definitely does it does yes and i have been burned out at times it's me like, too yeah yeah. <laughs> me as well I had the same experience that you had at the school district at my last clinical setting where I was like yeah it's time to I think it's time it's to time go to <laughs> yeah. yeah so I had the same feeling yeah and as a, yeah as just a behavior analyst I loved I did love the job but it was just I wasn't as effective and that's one of the things that our ethical code sort of tells us to do is that you have to be mm -hmm. you have to self-monitor to some degree in terms of you know w the way out that I determined it is that you know if somebody comes to you with a problem and your first thought is what do I need to do how am I going to solve this problem what's it what are the steps I need to take to start looking at this right that's good if your first thought is 
I really want to go back into my office and close the door, <laughs> then you're probably in a situation that it would probably be good to move on from right. or find a way to get yourself some new energy, take a vacation, do something. Right. But you're you're in a situation and, and it happens to everybody. It's like, don't be, don't personalize, mm -mm. right? Yep. Don't personalize. Yep. Even when I was in direct care and I, you know, I, I don't, well, I used to work with people that were very violent clients, like really violent, mm -hmm. right? And it's hard to maintain your distance, your your clinical distance when you're involved with breaking up a fight between people, for right. example. Like, and you have to get in there because you have to protect people who are getting hurt. And I recognized in my own behavior that when I would find myself biting my tongue, I had lost objectivity. Mm -hmm. I was no longer in, I, I was a part of the situation as opposed to being there to to separate people that I was right. now in it, right? Yep. And that told me I have to back off. And I, and I would try to teach people over the years, you know, recognize the signs in your own behavior that tell you that you, you're losing your objectivity and you need to take, take a step back. It's better if you're working on a ward or if you're working in a group home or if you're working in whatever setting you're working in. If you're a parent who you're trying to teach a parent, you know, parenting skills and that it's, an, it's a household where you've had child abuse, right? You want to teach the parents to recognize the the symptoms of, in their own behavior, the indicators in their own behavior that they're that they're losing it, and that that's the time that you need to step away and walk away from it and calm yourself down, mm -hmm. right, and get back into the into being there as a essentially in control of yourself. You're sort of outside of it, like you're a performer, right, right, as opposed to being in there. And so you need to recognize those things because we all have we all are subject to these mm -hmm. things, right? We're all subject to burnout. Yes. We're all subject to losing it a little bit, yes. you know, losing it with your kids. Mm -hmm. Everybody is subject to this. If you can recognize the signs that it's happening, you know that it's time to take a step back. Right. And that's really one of the things that they try to teach people in these family care programs is, right, how to take when to take a step back. I mean, and even in a lot of parent training, and I mean, that was one of the things in, when I went to work as an independent contractor that... It wasn't, you know, directly working with, it wasn't always directly working with the client anymore. It was working with the caregiver right. because you're only there for right. an hour or two a week and they're there the other however many hours. And so it's working with them on, yes, how to implement the, the interventions and the treatment plan, but also how to take care of themselves. Right. And if they're getting too overwhelmed, exactly. how to because it's this ever escalating. If one goes higher, the other goes higher and explaining that to them. So right. yeah, like you said, it's the same thing. We have to do the exact same thing with us that we're training others to do for right. themselves. Right, which I really like about Skinner's approach, the whole radical behavioral thing. You know, it's not, radical doesn't mean like crazy wild. No. Like radical, it means thoroughgoing, everything, everything that you do. So the behavior of the, of the therapist is under the same contingencies that the behavior of the person who's receiving therapy are, that everybody is part of this this thing, this this um, interaction, and that you need to recognize that as well. You're you're a part of it. So and there's no there's no the more we can depersonalize. It's like if you write a program and it doesn't it doesn't it's not as effective as you want it to be rather than like getting upset when people tell you it's not working or whatever it's not about you it's about okay what do we what's the problem what do we do to fix this mm -hmm. what's the you know why am i not getting accurate data it's not the it's nobody's fault it's there's something wrong maybe my data sheet's too complicated maybe it needs to be so, you know something something right so i don't know that's that's been the biggest thing in behavior analysis i think that i've and what you just said too the, the other you know the secret of behavior analysis is that behavior is a, you know, Pat Fryman says the secret we bring to the world that, that we know that other people don't know is behavior is a function of the environment. Right. Right. That this is like one of the biggest things that's been brought to humanity, mm -hmm. one of the biggest boons that's been brought to humanity in terms of how we affect change. Um, I think he's, I think he's really right on that. The other thing that I would say, the big secret of behavior analysis is we don't, our job is not to change the behavior of the person who we're tasked to change the behavior of in general. It's to change the behavior of the caregivers. Yes. It's all about the caregivers. That is 99.9% yes. 
Uh, maybe not nine. Ninety-five yes. percent yes. of the job is the caregiver yes. rather than the client. And rather than blaming the caregiver when they don't do <clears throat> right. what you want them to do, the whole point is your job is to change their behavior right. and to figure out a way to change their yep. behavior. Yep. Because when their behavior changes, then that's that's what when you'll see the, the client's person, behavior. Because you're not there enough to do. Yeah, but. Right, and I when I saw that presentation at FABA where they were like all these things that, you know, the people you work with say back to you, and it's, I, I'm sometimes uncomfortable with things I see at conferences where like people make fun of religion, people's religious beliefs, or they make fun of. I mean, we don't know. You don't. You don't know anything. Right. You're just a. You're just a monkey boy. You're just a monkey right. girl. We're just basically primates. You know, we're, yeah. we're we're just barely out of the trees at this point, and no. it's. You know, you shouldn't. You just shouldn't make fun of people. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll say so. One of my doc student mentors in grad school was uh was Tom Rakos. And I know the name. I don't he's know the person. At Barry College okay. in Rome, Georgia. And he probably taught me one of the one of the biggest takeaways I think I could have had for like clinical or not even clinical, just working with other people in general work. There was some type of I don't remember what the specific intervention was that the family wanted to try. The family wanted to try this intervention. They're like, oh, we heard this worked. And I'm like, what like what are they what are they doing? This is I'm this you know gung ho master student like no that's pseudoscience no that's blah 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 and this and that and Tom goes is that gonna hurt the client or their progress? I'm like no. Right. They're like then why don't we try it? Let's take some data on it. Let's see how it actually works. Exactly. What it's actually doing. He's like if it's not gonna actually hurt. hurt or get in the way of anything else, why not give it a shot? There's, in the ethics chapter, I actually have referenced two articles <clears throat> that go over decision trees mm -hmm. of when you confront what's called an alternative treatment. Yeah. How to approach it. And the, right. the question you ask is, is it causing harm? In which case you kind of, the flow chart like takes you down to the bottom of the chart is yeah. to intervene. But if it's not causing harm, then there's a you know you go through the flow chart and some and a lot of the times it's just like leave it alone yeah unless they're using like a lot of their resources mm -hmm. to pay for it and those resources aren't being used on something that actually is going right. to be effective but um, I mean but then at least at that point you would have some data that right. shows and how much resources are going into one versus correct. the other even facilitated communication you know right. when facilitated communication came out at Blakely did experiments with it at, right at uh, threshold yeah. right they looked at it it may maybe this works I don't know let's take a look let's see right. what's going on here so they they didn't just reject it out of hand exactly right which is I mean I think there's a lot of things like that yeah and I mean we're taught to be skeptics yes. but skeptics doesn't mean turning down absolutely everything that isn't that comes at us that we don't already know and agree with being Correct. skeptical means taking something in stride testing out and seeing if there actually is merit to it. It's not just hearing a new idea and being like, nope, I don't know anything about that. I don't believe it. Right. But when I talk to my kids about like religion, yeah. you know, I say, you know, belief in no God is the same as belief in God. Mm -hmm. It's you're just, you're, you have a belief whether you recognize it or not. Yeah. And I think you and I have talked about this before where I said science is technically a religion, if you kind of look at it, because it's a belief system. It could be. Could be. It can be. Yes. Unless it's just, if you follow science the way you should, if you follow those, you know, the assumptions of science, which is parsimony, and, yep. but philosophic doubt, that one of the things that differentiates science from religion right. is the concept of philosophic doubt, yes. that new data changes your view of how things work. Whereas if something is a matter of faith, you know, we mm -hmm. walk by faith, not by sight. What that's telling you is that it doesn't matter what I see. Mm -hmm. What matters is what I believe. And th there's a place for faith. I'm not saying there's not a place right. for faith. But it, they're just different. Science and religion are very different. So in the New Yorker magazine, um, 
Nancy Pelosi Mm -hmm. was quoted by saying, I didn't change my mind. The facts changed the situation. And I just saw that today, actually. And I was like, that brings up that same thing of philosophical doubt. Whereas... In terms of her deciding it's time to pursue impeachment. And that's for that. But that quote in general, though, you know what I mean? It's not that scientists are like, oh, they're so wishy-washy. They're, you know, flipping what they think all the time. No, it's the facts are changing the situation. facts change. Because of what you said before. We can only understand our world at this point in time as well as we can at this point in time. Right. In five minutes, we might be able, something might happen and occur that we can now understand our world differently. And Wait so, till the aliens land. Right. <laughs> the Area 51 raid right. didn't go so well. <laughs> well, I would not expect it. <laughs> well, it's, uh, that was another thing I was really interested in from the time I was a little kid was UFOs. And I, I have always felt there's some kind of phenomenon going on there and people make fun of it and they don't, but they're ignoring the phenomenon. Yep. And even the Air Force, I mean, you've got your military stuff. It's like, there's something going on here. We don't know what it is. Right. Okay. It's okay not to know. Yeah. It is okay not to know. As opposed to say, I don't know what it is, therefore it doesn't exist. Right. Right. That's not, <laughs> that's not very, um, they did that for a long time about meteors, you know, meteors. It's a steady state universe, and so there couldn't possibly be meteors, you know. Like. Steady state, my butt. Yeah, exactly. Well, all right, we good? I know that <laughs> you said we were not going to take up all of our time that we scheduled. Yeah. But we have officially taken up all of it's our time hours, that we scheduled. Two hours? Oh yeah. Oh my god. That is it. Oh my god. So Better edit this baby down. Um. Well, <laughs> it'll be a few, it'll be a couple of them. Don't you worry. But right. no, is there anything else that you want to leave? No, I just am very, um, people often ask me, you know, why didn't, why aren't you still working with whales? That's so exciting. You're, you're just like, that's so cool. And yes, and I miss it greatly. I would like to be out on the water every day. And I miss the people that I work with are constantly asking me to come back out there and work. And, um, but the reality is that I found that when I was working at the whale project, I kept talking about behavior analysis. I kept talking about stuff that I was doing back at Fernald or the clients that I was working with or the just the stuff that I was learning because it you know when you find something that is like real in the world that really works and seems to be something that um, regardless of what people think about it you know it's like what you were just saying you know the facts change your mind Um, I had this view of Skinner that was wrong I, I don't, I'm not a member of the cult of Skinner. I don't think Skinner has all the answers to everything in the world the way some people do. But it's an amazing science and it's amazingly effective and allows us to really help people who are in, um, in trouble. And by helping them, we're really helping ourselves. I've probably learned more from people with developmental disabilities than I've taught them. And so, or maybe it's equal, I don't know, whatever. I've been a beneficiary of this, so I just feel fortunate to have come upon behavior analysis and then been able to meet all the people that I have in this field and been lucky enough to have the supervisors I've had. So, I think that's a good place to leave it. There you go. There you go. You did it. Thought Leaders, a podcast brought to you by Opera Innovations. Every month, we will have a new thought leader coming to talk to us about their history, how they got into the field, and where they think the field is going or where they would like to see the field go. Next month, we'll be talking to Dr. Henry Rohn. And as always, if you have questions, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to email us at operantinnovations at avatechnologies.com.